All right, hello everyone. We've had our change in lighting, which means we're ready to start. So welcome to the Morrison Planetarium. My name is Guadalupe. I will be your host for this showing of Tour of the Universe. I am located in the pilot's booth behind you. Hello. Hi. No need to crane your neck for the rest of the show. You can just look on forward to the screen in front of you. So before we embark on our journey, a few house rules for everyone. Food and drink is not allowed in the planetarium, so if you manage to sneak any snacks in here, please sneak them right back out. We want to keep the theater nice and clean for everyone. If you have any electronic devices, such as cell phones, cameras, iPads, fancy internet watches, please make sure that they are silenced and put away and do not come out for the entirety of the show, as lights and sounds are especially distracting in this especially dark environment. Our planetarium is lined with six projectors at the base of the dome. If you happen to stand up during the show, you will be casting a giant human-shaped hole in our universe, which is not scientifically accurate. So for the sake of accuracy, please keep your seats for the entirety of the show. If you do need to leave for whatever reason, exits will be located at the top of the stairs, not at the bottom where you came in. Also, we are in an enclosed space, so we do ask that you keep your mask on the entire time that you are in the planetarium and on correctly, completely covering your mouth and nose. And lastly, this planetarium can create a very immersive experience, but I promise you that we are not actually flying through space. If at any point you feel motion sensitive, just close your eyes and the feeling should pass. All right, that's the last of my announcements. As soon as I see those last few cell phones in the audience put away, we will get ready to start. Go ahead and send that last text message. Explain to your boss that you're at a planetarium on a Wednesday. All right, thank you everyone. Sit back, relax, and enjoy your tour of the universe. So here we are at the starting point of our tour, right where we currently sit. We are looking down at Golden Gate Park from about three kilometers above the Earth. And we could see the De Young Museum across the street from us here, the Academy of Sciences here, and we are specifically right here in the right dome of the Academy. For many of us here at the Academy, San Francisco is home and home is a great place to start. But let's zoom out a bit now to try to get a look at our entire home planet. And as we begin our ascent, a few words about the software that I am using. It is called Open Space. It is a collaboration between uh, Linköping University in Sweden, the American Natural History Museum in New York and NASA and it is completely free for anyone to download. However, it is in its beta phases. So if you notice a few bugs here and there, just know that that is the software, that's not me. As we begin to zoom out, we could see the rest of the San Francisco Bay Area, my hometown of Oakland, California here, go A's. And as we begin to zoom out further, we could see the rest of the Pacific Ocean to the left and North America to the right. And finally, at around right here, we are at about 5,000 kilometers above the Earth and we could see our home planet in all its glory. One thing we can see from up here as well is this orange line that should be coming into view here. Let me move around to get a better look at it. We can see it right here, going around the Earth. And this actually represents the orbit of the International Space Station. The International Space Station orbits the Earth only 225 miles above the surface. It circles our planet once every 90 minutes, traveling at over 17,000 miles per hour. It is the largest object we have ever built in space, and it stretches over an area the size of a football field. The ISS is currently, and for the near future, humanity's only presence beyond the Earth, and as far as humans travel into space these days. As beautiful as our planet is, I think it's time for us to move on to the next stop on our tour, and that is Earth's nearest natural neighbor in space. Any guesses as to what that is? That's right, we are going to be visiting the moon. Between 1969 and 1976, NASA's six Apollo missions brought a total of 12 incredibly lucky guys to walk on the surface of the moon, the only brief presence of humans on another object in our solar system. 
At 2,400,000 miles from the Earth, the moon is on the furthest edge of the human scale. Some of you may even own a car with that many miles on it. You could even imagine driving to the moon if you drove for four months nonstop. Although I cannot recommend it, the roads are poorly maintained. There are two distinct areas that we see on the surface of the moon, these lighter colored mountainous areas and these darker areas called maria. The mountainous parts are what we call crater saturated, meaning that you literally cannot create any more craters there. If a meteor were to crash on the surface of the moon, which they do from time to time, the impact would create a crater, but it would also destroy the craters that are already there. The dark regions were created a long time ago when something very large and very heavy hit the surface of the moon and cracked open its surface. Hot lava poured out from the moon's interior to fill the impact zone, and when it cooled, it created the dark, smooth lunar maria that we still see today. As we move on to visit the rest of our universe, we're going to need a more useful measuring stick, since at these scales, using miles is like using inches to describe the distances between cities. Astronomers instead use the more convenient measurement of light speed. Light travels at the mind-boggling speed of 187,000 miles per second. So while it took the astronauts more than three days to reach the moon, traveling faster and farther than any humans have done so or since, it takes light only a second and a half to cross that distance at the speed of light. That's the time it takes only for a short pause in conversation. But now we take another leap out into the much greater realm of our solar system, watching the moon and the earth in its orbit as they recede. On our journey, we'll be traveling much faster than the speed of light at the speed of the human imagination, with the help of computer models showing us the most accurate images and information available. So now the nearest star to the earth, the sun should be coming into view. We should see it approaching here on the lower left. There it is. The sun is 93 million miles or eight and a half light minutes away, about the time it takes for a coffee break. We are zooming out to see the solar system and viewing the orbits of our planets in order from the sun. Can everyone help me name the first four planets from our sun? What's the closest planet? Mercury, the second. Venus, the third. You should know this one. Earth and the fourth, Mars. Excellent. You guys don't need me at all. These are our four rocky terrestrial planets. And as we zoom out further, we can see our two gas giants, our Jovian planets, Jupiter and Saturn here. And then out further, we have our two ice giants, Uranus and Neptune. And that's it, right? That's everyone. Is anyone missing? That's right. Last and among the least, Pluto in its eccentric tilted orbit. Those of you with good memories may remember that prior to 2006, Pluto was actually considered one of the planets. And you might be wondering what Pluto did to get kicked out of the club. Well, in the years after Pluto's discovery in the 1930s, astronomers have learned a lot more about what kind of objects exist in the outer region of the solar system known as the Kuiper Belt. Turns out there's a lot out there. Are we ready to see what the Kuiper Belt looks like? Yeah, that's it's a lot of stuff. Thousands of other objects, some even bigger than Pluto, have been found out here. So either we need to call all these other guys planets, or we need to redefine what a planet is. And that's exactly what astronomers did in 2006 when they reclassified Pluto as a dwarf planet. This is just a change in classification, and it does not make Pluto any less of a beautiful and fascinating world. So now as we speed away from our local neighborhood in space, we'll add the paths of the earlier spacecraft we sent out during the 1970s to explore the solar system. Pioneer 10, Pioneer 11, Voyager 1, and Voyager 2 which are the farthest traveling human-made objects, all traveling fast enough to escape the sun's gravity and leave the solar system behind. But even the most distant of these robot adventurers, Voyager 1, has not yet traveled as far as light travels in a single day. So we have now left our solar system and planetary, planetary scales far behind. 
And now we are in interstellar space, the space between the stars. Distances now become so immense, it will take us over four years at the speed of light just to reach the next nearest star system, the Alpha Centauri system. That's the time it takes from freshman year to, to graduation for a college education, if you're lucky. As we move further and further beyond even our most far-flung probes, we'll stop to consider whether humanity has made its presence known beyond the solar system. We are now inside the radio sphere. It represents the current limits of the most distant radio signals humanity has broadcast, or rather leaked, out into space. And it extends about 90 light years in all directions out from the Earth. Beginning in the 1930s, strong radio wave, early television and radar signals, and later the detonation of atomic weapons, emitted electromagnetic radiations strong enough to escape the Earth's ionosphere. Humans were broadcasting well before that, but the earliest radio was not quite powerful enough to escape the Earth. Since all these signals are electromagnetic, they travel at the speed of light. So this is humanity's electromagnetic footprint on the universe. Of course, the radio sphere is expanding at a rate of one light year per year, so this begs the question. Is anybody out there listening? Let's think about that for a moment. These markers indicate some of the many thousands of stars astronomers have discovered over the last 22 years, which have one or more planets orbiting them. We call them exoplanets, and we're looking for any of them that are Earth-like with conditions suitable for life as we know it. Our technology is not yet able to answer that question, but new generations of astronomical instruments are devoted to that search. The important point here is that quite a few of these planetary systems are within the 90 light year limit of our radio sphere and could have potentially received our signals. However, since radio waves travel at the speed of light, if there is anyone out there able to listen and to answer back, the communication delay between hellos could be decades in time. And of course, planetary systems beyond the radio sphere, more than 90 light years away, haven't heard from us yet but eventually will, as the radio sphere is always growing. As we pull back further, we will begin to see the Milky Way and its structure. I find this to be the most humbling moment of our show as we see mankind's influence on the universe. As huge as our radio sphere is, our radio imprint on the universe is tiny in comparison to the size of our galaxy. Now leaving the Milky Way and looking back at our spiral galaxy, we see that it is about 130,000 light years in diameter, a distance in time and space equal to the length of the history of the human species. The Milky Way is so huge, we estimate there are at least 300 billion stars in the galaxy. If our recent discovery of so many exoplanets just within our small neighborhood, within this vast star city, is any indication, there could be billions of planets and potentially millions of Earth-like planets throughout our single galaxy. And before the, we leave the Milky Way, let's take notice of the shape of our galaxy. It has a bright center and spiraling arms coming off of it. The Earth is in one of the arms. And when we look at it from an edge-on perspective, like this, as we will see in a moment, we could see that it is a very flat spiral. It nearly disappears when we look at it from edge on. The Milky Way is one of many hundreds of billions of galaxies that comprise the known universe. In this giant leap, we now see a view where each point of light represents not a star, but rather the location of an individual galaxy, each containing hundreds of billions, perhaps even trillions of stars. We live in the local group, which contains about 30 galaxies, large and small including the next nearest large spiral, the Andromeda galaxy, um, which is only about 2 million light years away, so pretty much just next door. And it's also headed right for us. We are going to get to know it pretty intimately in about 5 billion years. As our picture expands, we discover that galaxies are not distributed evenly throughout space, but clump together in clusters with great regions or voids that have very few galaxies. This picture represents the 30,000 closest galaxies to us in a space over 300 million light years across. The astronomer Brent Tully compiled this representation from the work of dozens of astronomers working over decades of time. 
and color-coded the densest regions of galaxy clusters in red. And now we can go out further to see the data from automated systems that are mapping even more distant galaxies. Even here in this view of the large-scale structure of the universe, we continue to see clusterings of galaxies with groups and strands and immense empty regions where little can be observed. By the way, the universe is not shaped like a bow tie. Remember when I asked you to take note of the shape of our galaxy? The dark regions where we don't see galaxies simply haven't been mapped yet. They result from our view from inside the galaxy, all the stars, dust, and gas nearby within our flat spiral, which obscure our view of the universe beyond. As the surveys scan more and more of space, the dark gaps will eventually be filled in. So now as we continue to move further out, we will begin to see these bright red dots on the outside of our little universe butterfly here. There they are. And what we, we, what we see here are not stars, not galaxies, but the brilliant cores, the central nuclei of very young, very distant galaxies. These are the quasars, short for quasi-stellar radio sources. And these blazing objects are all billions of light years away. So now we are looking so far back into the depths of time and space that the most distant quasars represent the universe at a much earlier age, near to the very beginning of galaxy formation. In other words, with the quasars, we're viewing a sort of awkward, gawky teenage version of the universe. And before there was a teenager, there was a baby. We are now looking even further back beyond the quasars to a time before planets, stars, and even galaxies began to form. This is the cosmic microwave background. All evidence indicates the universe we live in is about 13.8 billion years old. From data compiled by Planck and others, this is a picture of the infant universe a mere 380,000 years after the Big Bang, where space and time began. And it's not a typical photo, but a temperature density image. The light echo of the Big Bang, color-coded with light areas corresponding to the hottest, least dense regions, and dark areas the coolest, densest. These fluctuations in temperature and density are actually extremely tiny, varying by no more than one part per 100,000. But eventually they gave rise to the large scale structure of the universe, the clumping and clustering of galaxies everywhere. Figuring out just how that happened is one of the larger challenges for cosmological research today. Though our view here is of the outer edge of the known universe, the earliest light visible to us, that radiation actually persists all around us. It permeates the universe stretching and cooling as the universe expands over billions of years of time. So now that we have traveled back as far as the laws of physics allow, we really only have one direction left to go, and that is back home. So now I ask that you prepare yourself for this could possibly be the worst free falling dream ever. We are diving back in towards our planet crossing an expanse of over 13 billion light years, We've presented you with this view of our universe and the latest in cosmological and astronomical information, covering eons and observing objects billions of light years apart. We live in a golden age of astronomy. New generations of telescope and spacecraft are extending the reaches of our eyes, preparing for the eventual race between the advancement of technology and the accelerating expansion of the universe. <sighs> and with that thought, I want to remind you all that astronomy is for everyone. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to enjoy the beauty and wonder of our universe. All you need is a night sky, and if you can, get away from the lights of the cities and look up. Even a good pair of binoculars makes for a decent first telescope. Astronomy clubs around the world invite people to look through their telescopes and peer into the great beyond, allowing you to partake in the wonder that our universe has to offer. Astronomy as a hobby can offer an endless supply of satisfaction. I do hope that you'll join us who dream among the stars. So as we arrive